Here's a neat challenge that was posted to the Code Golf Stack Exchange. I'll leave a link in the description if you want to follow along or try it yourself. This was posted by user Wheat Wizard. So basically we're in a kitchen that has a particular rule, which is that every time we mix the pot, we have to add a new ingredient. So for example, salt then pesto is fine, but pesto then salt isn't fine because the pesto already contains salt. And so we aren't adding a new ingredient there. You can essentially think of each ingredient as a set of like sub ingredients. So for example, pesto would be the set containing salt, oil, and a bunch of other stuff that goes in pesto. Um, and then you have a commutative operator, sorry, an associative binary operator that takes two sets. And if the second one has some element not in the first, it produces the union of the sets. But if the second set is fully contained within the first set. It's undefined. So what this rule means is that you have to be careful about the order in which you combine things. And there are some recipes that you can't even follow because there's no way to mix the parts without breaking this rule. So for example, in this one, there is no ordering that will work because no matter how you try to order, you'll always end up with one set that is fully contained within the union, union of the previous sets. And so for example, in this first case, we can order them like so. And so here we add the five, then a three, then one and two, then six, and finally four. So this ordering would be valid. And so now the task is, given a list of sets, is it possible to actually follow this recipe uh, using this kitchen's rule? And so I'll go over this in Python first, just so we can get an idea behind how it works. Um, this is not going to be an efficient solution. I'm going to do this just using brute force. Um, but if you do have any ideas for a solution that runs in a more efficient time complexity, I would be interested to hear, so leave a comment if you think of anything. Okay, so let's first define a function that will take our list of ingredients, and then we can just feed the ingredient list into the function like so. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. So the general idea for this is we're just going to try all of the possible orderings. And so we can do this simply by importing iter tools, which lets us just do iter tools dot permutations of A. And so now we can do for order in that, we can print A. And so that gives us all of the possible, sorry, print order. That gives us all of the possible orderings of our ingredient list. And so now basically we can just go through all of these and so we'll maintain a set of what is currently in the pot, which will start out empty. Now we'll say for item in order, each item is going to be a set. So what we're going to check is if the item is fully contained within the pot, which we can do using the subset equals operator, which in Python you can just use less than or equal to between two sets. If the item is fully contained within the pot, then this is invalid. So we can set the invalid flag, or sorry, we can set the valid flag, which starts as true, to false, and then break out of the list. Otherwise, we'll mix the item into the pot. So in order to do that, we'll basically take the union of the pot and the item that we're adding in, which you can do using the single pipe, and you can do pot equals pot or item, or you can just use the shorthand pipe equals, and this will mix the item into the pot. If this order is valid, then we can just return true because we found a valid ordering. If we've exhausted all possible orderings in this for loop without finding anything valid, then we can return false. And so if we run this now, we'll get true. And if we feed in one of the counter cases that has no valid ordering, it will go through all of the possibilities and see that none of them work and it will return false. You can also skip having this flag if you use just break here, and then you can say like um, else. So in the for else syntax, I have a short on this that I'll link in the description as well. But basically, if break happens, it'll exit this entire thing and it'll skip the else. If the for loop exits naturally, so it exhausts order without breaking, it'll go to else. So you can just do else return true. And so this will do the exact same thing. It's a bit simpler in that it doesn't use a flag, but it does require you to be familiar with the for else syntax, which if you're not familiar with it, this can be a bit confusing. So I leave you with both options. So for the rest of this video, we'll go over it in two golfing languages, Jelly, which is a functional language, and 
Vyxel, which is a stack-based language. So the general idea is going to be the same. We're going to generate all of the possible permutations, go through all of them, and see if they work. The difference is, in both of these languages, it's not really that easy to loop through and break out in the middle. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate the entire answer uh, altogether. So the first thing we're going to do is provide our input. So in Jelly, we can just give it this. Um, it'll, the Python representation is just a list of lists. Sets are not a thing in Jelly, but if you provide them in the argument, they'll get uh, parsed into Python code, and then sets will become lists because that's how Jelly represents them. So the first thing we're going to do is generate all of the permutations. So if I format this a bit more nicely, you can see that this is basically the same thing we did earlier. It just generates all of the permutations of our list. And uh, this is getting truncated by the output size, I believe. Anyway, so this gives us our um, orderings. Now, basically, what we want to do is for each ordering, we want to check if it's valid, which will be some operator here that we'll do. And finally, we'll check if any of them meet that condition. The way we're going to do this, since it's not really so easy to uh, loop through and break out in the middle if it's invalid, is we're basically just going to keep taking the union and we're just not going to stop even if it's invalid in the middle. And we'll check at the very end. So let's say we have an ordering that's valid, 5, 1, 5, and 2, 3, 5. If we take the union at the first step, we just get 5. If we take the union again, we get 1, 3, 5. Sorry, I misread that, just 1, 5. And then if we take the union of this and the next one, we get 1, 2, 3, 5. So essentially what we're doing is we're cumulatively reducing on the union. We have a list of sets S1, S2, S3, and we want to first get S1, then S1, union S2, then S1, union S2, union S3. And so at the end, we'll have the reduction of the list of sets with the binary operator of union. But we want the intermediate values as well. So we're going to use the cumulative reduce, which in Jelly is the backslash. And the reduce function is OE pipe. This is technically multi-set union, which has a bit of differences that I won't cover. But if we're working with uh, single sets, so each element only shows up once, this is perfectly fine. So now if we take a look at what this returns, uh, let me split it up again. We see that this is what we get. So in our first um, example, it's just this ordering itself. And so we can see that we start with 5, then we union it with 3, 5, which gives us just 3, 5. Then we union it with 2, 5, 6, which adds in the extra 2 and the 6. Then we union it with 1, 2, 4, 5, which adds in the 1 and the 4. And finally, we union it with 1, 2, 3, 5, which doesn't actually add anything new. And so this is how we know that this is invalid. In at least one step, nothing new was added. In other words, two consecutive sets were the same or more generally speaking, two sets were the same. It doesn't matter if they're consecutive. In fact, they always will be if they're the same. So the method I originally came up with for checking if the uh, set is changing each time is I took the length of each of these and then I've, I checked if they were all incrementing. So the way you would do that is you use the length of each built-in and then you take the increments, which basically gives you the consecutive differences between each one and if it's valid, all of them will be truthy. So you can just check if all of them are truthy. If at least one of them is not truthy, that means that it's zero. And if there's a zero in the increments of the length, it means that two consecutive sets had the same length, which means that nothing was added in that step, making it invalid. And so we can just take this, put it here, grab the last four links, run in each operator, and then do any on it, which gives us a total of 11 bytes of code. This is a valid test case, and this is an invalid test case. However, there's a much more clever way to do this that was found by Jonathan Allen. Um, and so we sort of collaborated on our final solutions because uh, he had a s method of doing this that was one byte longer, and he had a method for doing this that was one byte shorter. 
And so when we combine the best parts of both of our code, we get the exact same solution. So definitely go upvote his post. The way he does it is by observing that we're basically just checking if all of these sets in our list were distinct. And so what we can do is we can take the uniqueified list. So let's say I use the argument uh, 5, 5, 3, 5, 3, and 4, 5, 3, 6. So we see here that these are not all distinct because these two are the same. And so when we uniqueify them using the Q operator or the deduplicate operator, whatever you want to call it, we get something different. If these sets were all distinct, we would get the same thing as before. And so how do you check if something is equal to itself under Q? You can use the invariant quick, which checks exactly this. It takes a parameter and sees if it's the same when you apply this to it. And so if we go back to this, this is now false. And so we can replace this entire thing, which is Q for deduplicate and invariant. And then we just need to update this to only grab the last two links because this is one link combining an atom and a quick. And this is also one link combining the multi-set union atom and the cumulative reduce quick. And so this gives us a 10 byte solution, which was the final one that both uh, Jonathan Allen and I are now using as our main solutions. But we do have differing original 11 byte solutions. With Vyxel, you're actually able to get this a bit shorter because Vyxel has different length plugins. And so notably, the permutations plugin is only one character. So that's already a one byte save over our Jelly solution. So let's grab this set. Um, like in Jelly, Vyxel also parses its inputs as Python. It also doesn't have sets, but it'll convert them into, a, uh, coerce them into arrays. So this is the Vyxel representation. And if we grab all the permutations of it, this is what we get. It's a bit messy to read through. Uh, I won't bother going over this, but it's the permutations built in. So we're going to do the same thing as before. We're going to for each, and so we'll use the lambda map for this because this allows us to combine multiple uh, elements into one map. We're going to do the exact same thing as before. We're going to cumulatively reduce over the union operator. So set union is this, and cumulative reduce is literally right above it, scan by. Uh, and in Vyxel, the ordering is a bit different. So this is a prefix operator, not a postfix operator like it is in Jelly. So this scans over set union. And so if we drop this, we can see that this is what we get. 5, 3, 5, 3, 5, 2, 6, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And then this last one doesn't add anything. So again, we can see if it's invariant after application. So this is why Vyxel doesn't save us two bytes, because the invariant meta element takes two bytes instead of one like it is in Jelly. And so although we can save two bytes, uh, I'll show you where the other, sorry, it's literally right here. Set union is one byte, so is permutations, but invariant is two bytes. So we only end up saving one byte in total here. And we can just find the deduplicate, or it's called uniqueify probably. Okay, it's just you. And so this will see if it's invariant under uniqueification, which it isn't. And so uh, you can see what it looks like here. It's different than if you don't uniqueify it, so it's not invariant under uniqueification. And so let's grab the permutations built in again, and then map lambda. or lambda map, sorry. And then that will give us a list where we get a one for every valid ordering and a zero for every invalid ordering. And so finally, we can just take the any of this, see if any of them are true. And so this will give us one and this will give us zero. Using flags is a way to save two bytes here, actually. Even if you count flags as a byte, you'll still save one. And that flag is the maximum flag. And so since we have a list of zero and one, any is the same as maximum, just like all is the same as minimum. And so if we look at maximum, it's capital G. So we can use the capital G flag and this lets us get rid of that. So that already saves us one byte. 
But because now we have nothing after the map lambda, we don't need the closing semicolon anymore. And so this lets us get seven bytes plus one flag. Now, let me try something, map lambda. I noticed that, oh, it's two bytes anyway, so this wouldn't actually save us any bytes, right? Yeah, okay, never mind. And so ultimately we can either get nine bytes without flags or we can get seven bytes plus one flag. And so that's seven bytes, or even if you count flags as a one-to-one, -one, which is an outdated rule on the Code Golf Stack Exchange, you'd still save a byte overall because of the ability to remove the semicolon after the map lambda. So thank you for watching this video. If you do visit this uh, question, be sure to try it out and also be sure to upvote this question. It's a very interesting challenge. And also, of course, be sure to upvote Jonathan Allen's solution as well. Um, and that's all. Thank you for watching.